Cain, and we've been talking about all of that, amen, and so this morning, we just want to continue along those lines in verse 19 and towards the end, amen, they have this little phrase right here, and it says, amen, he divided their land to them by lot, and that's what I want to cover, amen, this morning, he divided their land to them by lot, amen, and what Paul is doing, amen, he's summarizing our history. And so when you see these little sentences, it's so much, amen, that's packed within these sentences. And that's why we're here to just expound that, to just unpack it. He divided their land by lot. And so we'll have two points, amen, this morning. We'll talk about he divided. And then secondly, we'll talk about by lot. And I'm praying I can get to it, saints, amen. And so that we can do what we have to do. Amen. So let's begin with point number one. He divided. He divided. So Father, we pray you bless the word as we read it. We pray you bless it as we hear it. We pray you bless us as we expound and exegete it, O King. We pray that you would be lifted up and your enemies would be scattered. In Jesus' name. Amen. He divided. The he here... In verse 19 refers to none other than God again. Remember, it's God that's doing all the work. And so what it's saying is, is that after God, amen, destroyed seven nations, after delivering us out of Egypt in the Exodus, he destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan. The Bible says that God divided their land. All right? And this is referring to the latter days of Moses. In the days of Joshua, when the land, amen, was possessed by Israel and then given out, all right? Somebody say divided. The word divided here literally means to distribute. And it means to distribute an estate or an inheritance, all right? This is a succession term. It's a term, amen, uh, that has to do with inheritance. Now, when he says he divided, it means he distributed the land as an inheritance. He distributed the land as an inheritance. Now, the word inheritance is a property or a possession that's passed on to an heir. It's when somebody leaves you something. Now, somebody done got excited up in here, all right? It's when somebody leaves you something, all right? Now, in the Hebrew world, we're not too familiar with that because they don't really leave us too much. But bills and problems. Say, that was back then. That was back then. Somebody say, I won't go back. <laughs> all right? All right? An inheritance. All right? It's when you pass on something to an heir, property or possessions to an heir. All right? Now, an heir is a person who inherits the property. Yeah. All right? They inherit the property or possession from a deceased person. All right? They inherit it because of descent. That means that they're a child or grandchild or great-grandchild. Descent, descendant, you know. They inherit it because of a relationship, amen, might be a spouse, a husband or a wife, you inherit. They inherit it because it might be through a legal instrument or a legal document, legal procedure. Uh, uh, the easiest form of that would be a will, you know, where somebody gives you something through, through bequests. They say, I bequeath this unto, unto Donald Harvey, amen. That's in a will, amen. And that's the way we inherit things as an heir. huh? And the legal heir actually secedes, amen, secedes, amen, uh, uh, the decedent. The person who passes away, the legal heir secedes them. That's why it's called succession. And the word secede means to take the place of another. Oh, God have mercy. It means that the person who originally owned it, they pass away. But you succeed them. You take their place. You represent them. And all of their property rights, everything that they own, you now own. Every right that they had, you now possess. Anybody hear me up in here? 
Somebody say succession. And that's what it's all about. You see? When it says he divided the land, it's a term of inheritance, of, of heirship. It's a term of succession. You see? They inherited the land. You see? God divided the land. It means he, he gave Israel at the time their rightful inheritance. He gave them their succession. Amen. He, he gave them as heirs of Shem, as heirs of Abraham, would rightfully belong to them through the legal promises and process of the word of God. Because Shem, with Noah and the Most High, made an agreement that this particular land, and we have the dimensions of it in the scriptures, that they would belong to Shem, the children of Ebra, the sons and daughters of Abraham, the sons of Isaac, and later we would call them Israel. Come on, give y'all some glory. Amen. All right. It was a property right established by God. As we look at our Bible, amen, you can look at Genesis 12, 6, and you'll see this property right. Watch this, because <coughs> I don't want you to get it twisted here. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible corroborates everything that we say. In Genesis 12, 6, the Bible says, And Abram, that's Abraham, he passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, all right? And Shechem was in, amen, uh, Manasseh, which is the land of Israel, unto the plan of Marah, and the Canaanite was in the land. <clears throat> and the Lord appeared unto Abraham. Remember, the Canaanites weren't supposed to be there, but they was in the land. It belonged to Shem, but Cana took it upon himself to usurp the land through, through sedition and, and through uh, uh, thievery. But in seven, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So right here we have a promise, show. We have a legal instrument. This is a will right here. This, this, is, this is a will that's recorded, not in the clerk of court of the 15 JDC. It's recorded in the clerk of court, in the most highest court in heaven. Anybody hear me up in here? The angels got it done. And the land, God says, I'm going to give to you, Abraham, and I'm going to give it to your seed. All right? Now, now watch this. Amen. In 1518, all right, because you see, when property is exchanged in the courthouse, you have to be particular about the property. When we do a document, when we sell property at Royal Title, we just don't put the address, amen, because sometimes municipal addresses can be mistaken and could be wrong. I've heard of situations where one property got two municipal addresses. Sometimes you got a property that's located in two, two cities or two parishes, and, and it just overlaps, and you got two addresses. But one thing that you could never get wrong in a property exchange is something that's called the property description. Oh, God have mercy. Anybody hear me up in here? And usually in the property description, they'll have landmarks. Amen. They'll have uh, 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 particular meets and boundaries of the land. Amen. And, and, and that's going on. Well, in our Bible with the promised land, Genesis 15, 18 is our property description. Oh, y'all ain't ready for this. Y'all ain't ready for this. <coughs> And the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And this is a short property description, but this is one of them. And from this property description, I could show you, if I wanted to, a picture of what the whole promised land looked like that was promised to Abraham. It's not just that little slit of land right off the coast of Mediterranean where people that's not us residing right now. But it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. Actually, it's about 205 million acres is what it is. Y'all ain't ready for this. Y'all ain't ready for this. <laughs> we could break down the amount of Hebrews and, hey, God, let, let me move on. Let me move on. You see? 
Have everybody get them a little something. But, but in Genesis 13, 14 and 15, watch this. The Bible says here, but it wasn't just to Abraham's seed like Isaac and Jacob. And the, the, the land wasn't just given to them by God just for a limited amount of time. He says in, in 13, 14, he says, And the Lord said unto Abram, After that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou, thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it unto thy seed. How long? Forever. <clears throat> Dele. Dele. Yeah, just a little something. How long you say you were given? So, not only was this land for the immediate descendants of Abraham in the days of, of Joshua, we see that the land would be for all the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even to this day right now. I got a word for you, Philadelphia. I got a word for you, Judah. You have an inheritance. Anybody hear me up in here? All right. Hallelujah. Put this one up. I don't know where this one come from. I don't drink where. I don't know where it come from. You see? <laughs> Not too many people like me. I don't drink anywhere. I don't... So, so, I don't know how we're going to get there or when it's going to happen. But I need to let you know that you have land. You have property that's been willed to you. That's been running in your royal family since the days of Shem. You see? He divided the land. Now in Jeremiah 32, amen, in 36, watch this. He's going to talk about us in the land. Hallelujah. I just need to make sure I ain't skipping nothing, y'all. Because this is important for Israel. He say prophesy to the dry bones. This is going to change the way we see ourselves. Jeremiah 32 and 36, look what he says. And now, therefore, thus said the Lord God, the, the God of Israel, concerning this city, he says, whereof ye say it shall be delivered, delivered into the hand of the Chaldeans or the king of Babylon. Thank you, Nelly. All right. Look like the same one, but at least I know where this one comes from. Yeah, coming from his hands, it's good, it's good. <laughs> so, so watch this. He say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by famine and pestilence. So Babylon is about to take over <coughs> Israel and our land because of our own sins, our own iniquity. And because of the Deuteronomy, 28 curses are about to come in operation right here as well. In 37, but God is going to make a little promise right here. He says, that's for now, but let me show you what's going to happen later on. You're not going to be in your land in the immediate future, but let me show you what I'm going to do for you in the near future. He says, behold, I will gather them out of all countries where I have driven them in my anger and in my fury. And in great wrath. And I will bring them again unto where? This place. And he's speaking from Israel right now. He's speaking from Jerusalem right now. <coughs> and I will cause them to dwell, watch this, safely. That phrase right there, I will cause them to dwell safely. Let's us know that this is a future thing. 
This is not in during the days during, of the Roman occupation when, when Christ came because the Romans occupied. They were not dwelling safely. These are the, and we know that this phrase also tells us that the current people in our land is not us because they dwelling, but they're not dwelling. Oh, y'all ain't ready. <coughs> y'all ain't ready. Y'all ain't ready. Because when the real people get back, they going to dwell. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because until the real people get the land, the land, the city is going to be a trembling cup. It's going to go from one hand to the other because, and they're going to fight over it because it don't belong to none of them. Anybody hear me up to this? <coughs> President Nasser said, he said, they're never going to have peace over there. He said, because they left white. They, they, they left black. And they came back white. Oh, God. So anybody hear me up in here? He said, I'm going to bring the real people back. And when they get back, they're going to do what? Safely. Okay. All right. We got, we got over that. And 38. And they shall be my people. Ain't going to be none of that idolatry. Ain't going to be none of that offering our children to Molech. Ain't going to be none of that we belong to somebody else. No, no, no. They're going to be my people. Watch this. And I will be their God. All right? All right? We're going to move forward with it. We're not going back to the way it used to be. We're not going back to the book of Judges. We're not going back to the book of Kings. We're not going back to those things. And that day, when it happens, something different going to happen in us. We're going to really be his people, and he's going to really be our God. Verse 39, amen, and before I get to 38, we know that the current people are not the people because they're in our land, but as you, as you watch the way they act, they don't act like his people, and they don't act like, amen, that he's their God. In fact, they try to take God out of everything according to the protocols. Anybody hear me up in here? Hallelujah. And let me tell you, amen, they compete with San Francisco in the sexual immorality and the perversions that go on, amen, in our land. Amen. Oh, no, my friend, it's clear. They not the people. Who the people? You better believe it. You see? In 39. This is one of my favorite parts this morning as I read. And I will give them. Can you do this with me for a second? This is the prophecy. This is the will of God for us. The only way he can give us one heart is if we hadn't had one heart before. If division and schism is characteristic of the way we treat each other, if 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 black on black crime and black on black violence is 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 the way we treat each other, he said, but a day is coming soon where supernaturally, providentially, divinely. Something is going to change, and it's not going to change in our circumstances. It's not going to change, hallelujah, and, and, and where we live first. It's going, it's, listen, he's going to do it all of a sudden from the inside. He's going to give us what? One heart. We ain't going to want to kill each other no more. We ain't going to have gangs and fighting each other no more. We ain't going to be jealous of one another no more. We're going to frequent each other's businesses. We're going to support one another. Spend our money in our own communities. Get under and follow the God-ordained leaders that he sent. He's going to give us, y'all, one heart. You see? And that day is coming soon, y'all. You see, he never do anything without letting his prophets know first. And before God do anything in his people, his prophets going to stand up and declare what he is about to do. You're going to wake up one morning and the people going to be unified. 
You're going to wake up one morning and the people going to walk together, work together, live together, love together, build together. He's going to give us one heart. And he also going to give us in that day one way. And I don't know if you know who the way is. <laughs> Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You understand what I'm saying? That's the way he's talking about. You see? That they may fear me. How long? This is a future thing. Because once we get there and once we get right, it won't be any going back. We're going to fear him. We're going to reverence him. We're going to respect him. How long? Forever. And it's going to be for the good of them and of their children after them. In verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Now, he's being particular about the covenant because some covenants are not everlasting. Because the old covenant was going to pass away. He's saying he's going to make an everlasting covenant with us. And in other places, he says, it's not going to be like the covenant he made with us in the days of Moses when he brought us out of Egypt. He's talking about the new covenant here. He's talking about the cross of Yahshua, Jesus Christ. He's talking about saving us for real, y'all. So if we don't fulfill the law, amen, with our lips and not our hearts, amen, he would do an inside job. He would save us for real. Through the blood and the body of Yahshua Jesus. The crown of thorns would be for the sins of our mind. The piercing of the hands would be the sins that we put our hands on. The piercing in the feet, like Brian said, would be the places, the sinful places we went. The piercing of the heart would be the thoughts of our heart, the, the motives, amen. The cross was a complete finality of, 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 of the sin. Hallelujah, debt that we owe. God did it, y'all. And he did it at the cross of Calvary. Come on, give God some glory. And it's an everlasting covenant. Amen. He says, and I will not turn away from them. Look the finality of it. Look how in the future it's going to be. We get the land, we have the new covenant, we want people, and he's not going to turn away from us. You see? There's no more conditional covenant like Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and the curses, that's done with. Hallelujah. You're no longer a servant but a son now. Anybody hear me up in here? And a daughter. He said, I will not turn away from them. You see? I'll be with you always, even to the end of the earth, to do with them good. He says, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good. Watch this. And I will plant them in this land. This word plant is a, hallelujah, a permanent word. It means to fix something, to fasten something, to establish something with the intent of it never being uprooted again. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me up in here. Y'all ain't hearing me up in here. Hallelujah. Assuredly, he says, I will plant them in this land. Assuredly, what, what? With my whole heart. And with my whole soul. For thus said the Lord. Like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people. Slavery. Jim Crow. Separate but equal. Police brutality. Violence. Huh? As I have brought all this great evil upon this people. So will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. Come on, give y'all some glory. And one of the promises is, is the promise of a land that he would give to Abraham and his seed forever. You know, he says in 43, I'm just going to read it, 43 and 44. And fields shall be bought in this land, whereof ye say, it is desolate without man or beast. It is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Men shall buy fields for money and subscribe evidences and seal them and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin 
and in the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, and in the cities of the mountains, and in the cities of the valley, and in the cities of the south. Watch this. God is saying, it might look bad to you right now, Jerusalem. It might look bad to you right now, Jeremiah. But commerce is going to happen in this land again. You're going to buy and sell land over here again, just like you bought and sold. And remember, he had told Jeremiah before Jeremiah left to buy. Hallelujah, a field, the potter's field, to buy a field as an act of faith that one day Jeremiah would come back and his descendants would come back. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me up in here. God is saying, go ahead, buy some because y'all coming back. Come on, give y'all some glory, amen. He says, for I will cause their captivity to return, saith the Lord. That captivity is the word exile. It's the prisoner status. He's saying you won't be in exile for long now. You won't be a prisoner for long now because your captivity is about to return. The Bible says he divided the land. He gave it for inheritance. And even though, amen, we might be in exile, amen, the promise still stands. But the promises of God are yes and amen. Hallelujah. And his gifts and callings are without repentance. It still belongs to us, y'all. And one day, he's going to take us home. Come on, give y'all some glory. I don't know how, I don't know when, and we're going to talk about that part in a second here. It's not for us to worry about. It's not even for us to make it happen. We focus on getting an everlasting covenant. We focus on being saved. We focus on being one. And God's going to take care of the rest. Come on, give y'all some glory. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. In 1319, he says, and he divided the land. Amen. He divided the land to them. Then he says, by lot. Somebody say, by lot. <coughs> amen. And that word lot right here is not, amen, the real estate property when you buy a lot, amen, in a neighborhood. That's not the term right here. This lot, amen, refers to a practice that the Hebrews used to do when they needed to make a decision and they didn't know which way God wanted them to go. They had all the facts and they had all the witnesses, but they still couldn't ascertain the will of God. Uh, what they would do, they would cast lots, amen. It was kind of like, amen, a roll of the dice, amen. And through that, they would pray, God, in the mighty name of Jesus, well, I'm saying Jesus, they would say, most high, as we cast this lots, you make the decision which way the lot would fall. Amen. But they didn't have to pray it, amen, because the fact of the matter is, is that Proverbs 16.33 says this. It says, the lot is cast in the lap. Watch this. He says, but the disposing of it is of the Lord. The lot is cast into the lap, but the disposing of it is of the Lord. Now, let me show y'all that on the NLT to make a lot more sense for y'all people who used to shoot the dice on the streets and stuff like that. <laughs> Amen. I see y'all people, but let me tell you, I'm from the hood myself. <laughs> Hallelujah. We may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. You, you hear it? <coughs> Anybody hear me up in here? So what happened was in Joshua 18.10, when we got into the land the first time, God told us, he said, go ahead and separate the land between the tribes. He said, but I want y'all to cast lots for it. And so that's what they did. And Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord. And there, according to the lot and their size, Joshua divided the land into the children of Israel according to their divisions. All right? And so it looked like when you cast lots, it's just like what they would call luck or chance. But Scripture tells us different. I want to tell you this morning that there's no such thing as luck. Yeah. Woo! And there's no such thing as chance. And I know that in our English language, since we speak this language, 
we have the uncanny knack of saying, you know, it was luck, you know, it was fate, it was chance, and I say fate, F-A-T-E, not F-A-I-T-H, fate, amen, hallelujah, but because that fate is good, but F-A-T-E is like chance, it's like coincidence, it's like, amen, as though the universe capriciously decided that something would fall our way. Let me tell you Oh, God, nothing. <laughs> nothing in God's heaven and earth is by chance, by coincidence, or capricious in any way. For even when we roll the dice, the very numbers it fall on is all done by the sovereign, providential hand of the most high God. Come on, give y'all some glory. Amen. Hallelujah. So they cast lots, y'all. All right. And we studied, amen, all the tribes before. And we studied, amen, who lived where and who went this way and that way. Amen. And it seemed like, amen, those that love water, those that Jacob had prophesied in Genesis that they would be seaworthy people, amen, as though they were destined to be in the water. God, by the casting a lot, put them right by the water. He put everybody where they were supposed to be. He put the farmers by the fertile land. He put the fishermen by the ocean coast, amen. And it looked like accidents, but in this life, there is no accidents. Our God is sovereign. <laughs> you see, he knew my batteries were not. Right when they did. You see? <clears throat> so nothing is by chance. You see? All is done by providence. Examples in our Bible is when they couldn't figure out why the boat was going down in Jonah's day. The Bible said they cast lots between each other. And the lot fell on Jonah. And they went up to Jonah and said, Jonah, now you tell us what's going on. <laughs> All right? Another example of that, when Achan had stole the wedge of gold and the Babylonian garments. They couldn't figure out who it was, so they cast lots. And the lot went from the tribe to the family to Achan and his family, all the way down. You see, we throw the dice, but God decides where it lands. Anybody hear me up in here? Even in the New Testament, when they couldn't figure out who to pick to replace Judas, Peter and the rest of them boys went back to the Old Testament way of saying, oh, God, we're going to cast the lot, but you're going to make the decision. And they chose, I think it was, uh, who was it, Matthias? To, thank you all, to, to replace uh, Judas Iscariot. Now, we don't do this too much anymore because we got the Holy Spirit on board. And we pray now and the spirit living inside of us so we don't have to do that as often. But I've seen sometimes me and First Lady, we used to do it a long time ago. We'd be in a place, can't figure out what to do. we like, oh, God, should we buy it? Should we get it? we pull out an old coin. And we say, oh, God, we know that you in control and you sovereign. So let this thing fall on what you want us to do. And we go like that and I think, pow, let's buy it. Let's get it. But that was always for Israel a last resort. When somehow all the facts convoluted the situation where you couldn't hear, where you, where you don't have good godly people around you because in the multitude of counsel there's safety, amen? And so they would cast the lots because they knew that God, amen, was in control. I want to teach y'all a word, amen, before we go. And it's the word that we call theologically, we call it providence. All right? Providence. First point was identity. Second point is theology, baby. Providence. All right? Pastor, what is providence? It's the exact opposite of luck and chance. In fact, as a believer, as a Hebrew, we need to wean ourselves off the pagan way of even talking. And I'm guilty of it myself. We offend our God when we talk about luck, when we talk about chance. All right? Sambu, I'm about to skip over some things, and I'm going to come back to this place. 
You want to know where luck and chance come from? You want to know where, where fortune come from? Where fate, F-A-T-E, come from? It come from the pagans. It come from the heathens. It come from the idolaters, the Romans and the Greeks. They had a, a Greek false goddess named Fortuna. You see? And in the Greek, they call her Tykai. I don't know if I'm saying her name right. Tyke. I call her Tyke. You see? And this false Greek Roman god was the daughter, amen, of Zeus and Aphrodite, who Aphrodite was Zeus's daughter. So she was the product of an incestuous relationship. This Greek goddess, false goddess, she had a wheel called the Rota Fortune. And she would spin it. You see, sound boot, y'all got to stay with me. <laughs> Rota Fortuna, she would spin it. And when she would spin the wheel, the wheel decided what would happen in people's life. Not God. Not providence, not sovereignty. The will would decide. So if you won a victory in battle, it was Fortuna who gave it to you. If you, if you got pregnant and had a child, it wasn't the most high that said children is heritage of the Lord. It was Fortuna that said you lucked up. You lucked up by chance and, and got a child. If something bad uh, uh, happened to you, uh, uh, Fortuna, didn't, the will didn't spin your way. You see, now this, uh, ro, ro, how you say, it? Put, put it back up here, that Rota Fortune is also called the Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> see, you don't know why people be naming stuff. You don't know where we live in. You don't know we're still in Babylon. We're still in Egypt. We're still in Rome. And we use all of these terms. We say all these things, and these people right under our noses. Playing games with the most high God. There is no wheel of fortune, friend. Even when Pat said Jack them turn that thing, <laughs> the number it fall on, it ain't Vanna that's choosing that. It's the most high that's choosing the numbers that that fall on. I don't care if they push a button to cheat or not. I'm going to show you all. Somebody say Providence. See, isn't that something, though? You see? Yeah. She represented chance. All right? And it wasn't just her. In many other traditions of the Gentiles, they tell you to put a four-leaf clove on it. For luck. Or put a horseshoe over your door. Oh, I think I'm in somebody's business up in here. Yeah, you're going to go home and take that down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a rhema word. It's a rhema. You're going to go home and take that down. And you ain't going to do St. Patrick's Day like you used to do it. That's all idolatry. That's based in the Greek and the Roman system. And it's insulting the providence of our God. You see? They say things like, I thank my lucky stars. <laughs> what the stars got to do with anything? And we got to watch ourselves to appear like them, to talk like them, to, to fit in, to, to, to merge, to assimilate, to amalgamate in their system. We say things to sound like them, to talk like them. But it insults our God, y'all. Oh, God have mercy. Come on now. Let's go back. Nothing is by chance. There is no such thing as luck. There is only providence. Dr. Vernon McGee says that Watch this. Providence is the means by which God 
directs all things. All things. Animate, inanimate, seen, unseen, good, evil. He directs all things towards the fulfillment of his will. Everything. Everything that happens, God is directing to an end. That's providence. You see? That's providence. Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Psalm 103.13 says, his kingdom, watch this, his kingdom, like as a father pitied his children. Oh, no, that's not it. Oh, God. Hallelujah. But, but Brent, I gave it to you. And that's my handwriting, so I can't complain. In the songs, but it ain't 103, 13. It says his kingdom rules over all. All right? And it's a few things that come with providence. Y'all just stay with me for a second. Because it ties within our first point. It's our land. It was given by lot. It was given by providence. And providence determines how things going to happen. And God uses everything in creation. Grass, rain, trees, birds, cats, dogs, lions, tigers, bears. Oh my, he used everything in creation to fulfill his will. The old hymn writers say, sun, moon, stars, stormy wind, snow, all fulfilling his will. You see? Few things in providence. Production, preservation, you see, governance and concurrence. Production, preservation, governance and concurrence. Providence means production. He created everything. Providence means preservation. He sustains and maintains everything. He created, watch this, and he keeps it together. The world was held together by the what? By the word of his power. Production, preservation, watch this, but governance. This means that God, the most high God, not only created, not only sustains and maintains, but he rules. You see, the heathens don't believe that God rules. They don't believe that he governs. They don't believe that he sit high, but he look low, and not a sparrow falls to the ground without him knowing he rules and reigns over everything, y'all. Somebody say providence. You see? But it also means concurrence. All right, and I'm going to show you that in a second. You see? Providence means that the hand of God is in the glove of human events meaning that you see the glove and you see the glove doing things it might be people it might be nations it might be things happening and you see just the glove but you can't see the hand of God that's in the glove he is what the theologians call the first cause the glove is just what's over the hand it's the second cause <laughs> When the glove touch you, you think it's the glove touching you. That's the second cause. It's actually the first cause, which is the hand that made the glove touch. Oh, God have mercy. That's providence. We, you got to see the providential hand of God in life. And the church has lost this. We judge the things that's happened to, and to us by faith, by luck, by chance. By she did it, he did it, they did it, Russia did it, America did it. Who did it? Hey, that's providence. I think we got it. I think we got it. All right, all right. God is the steering wheel, y'all. He is the rudder that's underwater on a ship. You can't see it, but it's controlling the destination of the ship. You see? One theologian said that we all on a big old boat. But when we left port, God decided where the boat was going. Now, while we on the boat, a lot of stuff going on. There's some people cutting up, some people worshiping. 
But guess what don't change? The destination of the boat. Oh, God have mercy. So a lot of things go on, but God's still going to get the world. Still going to get humanity where he wanted to be in the end. Come on, give y'all some glory. Providence. He rules and he reigns. Some examples. We, we're about to go, but he had a baby cry by the Nile River. At the same time the baby cried, a daughter of Pharaoh, who probably wanted a child, was by the river. The cry, many people probably heard, but the cry providentially touched a certain person's heart. The person that the cry touch was the daughter of a king the king who gave the order that all male children should die except when the daughter of the king come with a male child and said daddy can you spare this one on my behalf but baby he a hebrew son but no daddy i've adopted him he my son since he my son that makes him your grandson and now this boy who was supposed to be killed, supposed to be sent up the river, now he grows up as a prince of Egypt, raised, educated, taught in the Egyptian way, and would later become a deliverer for the people of Yah. Somebody shout providence. He rules and reigns over everything. There's no accidents in your life. He's working it out, y'all. You see? There was a little orphan girl with no mama and no daddy. Being taken care of by a relative, some would say an uncle. But she was pretty to look on. For some reason, God made her pretty. And one day, an emperor of a large swat of the earth at that time, Ahasuerus, had a beauty contest. He had a beauty contest and she was born beautiful. And God touched that heart of that king. The king, the heart of the king is in the Lord's hand and the rivers of water he turned it whithersoever he wanted to go. At that time, he touched that king's heart with the beauty of that Hebrew woman. I don't know what she did when she walked up in there. I don't, I don't know what she did, Deli. Ezra say, Lord, my Lord and my God, marry her, make her Queen Esther. Right during a time when an adversary of our people would be raised up, the wicked Haman, who would decree a genocide of the Hebrews. But while the devil was working, God had already worked in providence. And Mordecai told Esther, who knows? Who knows? If you was made queen, if you was raised up, if you was blessed for such a time as this, somebody shout providence. providence. And I'm telling you, man. He working it out. And you don't know what he's doing. You don't know how he's doing it. He do it through beauty he doing it. Through a baby's cry he doing it. And one of the things about providence, amen, I told you a word that's called concurrence. Say that with me, concurrence. 
Concurrence is when two things work together. You see? It's when two things work together. You need to understand that, hallelujah, God, amen, he concurrently works his providential will through men. Even when men don't know he working. <laughs> you see? Remember, the Lord is working in and through all his creatures to bring about his will. You see? You see? We might not have the same intent as God when we work. We even might have evil intentions when we do a thing. But no matter why we work, why we do the things we do, his providence causes evil, even evil intentions to work out for his good and for his purpose and his will. That is the power of providence. People can be trying to do you wrong and still push you closer to the will of God in your life. There was a little boy born in Israel. And he was the prize of his daddy. He had an administrative knack and an attention to detail like none of them. And he loved the most high and he loved his daddy. His daddy favored him so much, bought him a coat of many colors. His brothers was jealous of him. And because of that jealousy intended to do evil to him. They saw him coming. They say, look, come the dreamer. And let's kill him. Thank God, Judah, back then, was still about his lajon, his paper. He said, why kill him for free when we can sell him for some money? So they sold him into slavery with evil intentions. They sold him into slavery that they would never see him again. They sold him into slavery to take the competition out of the house so that their father would love them. That was their intentions. But providentially, God had a whole nother intention involved. <laughs> Concurrence means that people can intend wrong, but God can still work right out of it. Hey! By the time Joseph get, hallelujah, to Egypt, he become the number one in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife, evil intentions again. Try to get rid of me, say, nah, I can't do that to God. Evil intentions. See, tell him, oh, he tried to take advantage of me and abuse me. Evil intentions. They put him in jail. But guess where he go in jail? Straight to the top. Number one in the jail. His brothers had evil intentions. Potiphar's wife had evil intentions. But God had a totally different intention in mind. In that jail where God, where, where he was going to make the connection between a king and a prophet. Anybody hear me up in here? And we know the story. Joseph interpret those dreams, bust up out the jail, become the second in command under Pharaoh. By the time he meet his brothers, he teach them something about providence in Genesis 50. He said, look, fellas, he said, look, he said, you intended this for evil. He said, but God worked it out for good. Amen. Anybody hear me up in here? Yeah. You thought evil against me, but God meant it a good to bring it to pass. Not only good for me, no, but watch the providence to save much people alive. You see? That's providence, yo. You see? God will even work through wicked intentions. You see? The Bible talks about the mystery of iniquity. You see? That even in evil, God's still going to work out his plan. Listen, he's not the author of sin, though. But he's so wise, he can even use sin to bring about what he want to bring about. Y'all ain't. 
he just that he he just that cold. Anybody hear me up in here? It's like he get punched and use the weight of the person who punched him to wind up another punch. Oh God, you see. Professor Burkhoff, uh, theologian, says God overrule, overrules evil for good to fulfill his own purpose. Uh, another example of that would be uh, Judas. <laughs> his will was always to get Jesus to the cross. And he used the evil intentions of Judas to get there. Judas sold him out, Ju Ju Judas, Judas sold him out for silver, 30 pieces. He thought he was hurting God. He thought he was hurting Jesus. But he just got Jesus closer to his purpose. Because he was born to die for the sins of the world. Come on, give y'all some glory. We almost done. I'm talking about concurrence, y'all. You see? Concurrence. You see? When you understand providence... It makes adversity different in your life. John Piper say, you're patient in adversity. And you're thankful in prosperity. Because you know it's not luck that did it for you. It's not chance that did it for you. But it was the most high who did it. Piper says, you're confident in the future. Because you know that no creature that God done created can separate us from his love. Since all the creatures are in his hand, he will never govern in a way to make any of his creation, hallelujah, separate you from his love. Come on, give y'all some glory, amen. There is no such thing as luck, no such thing as chance, no such thing as fortune, amen, amen. So put away the fortune cookies. Stop going to the fortune teller. All right? It's all about providence. And when things look like they happen on accident or by random, 1 Kings 22 and 34, we, I'm telling you, we're about to leave, but this is just good theology. You see? He had told Ahab that he was going to die. But watch this. And Ahab, he dressed in a manner that was not kingly. He dressed like a regular soldier. You see? He made the other king of Judah dress like a king because they went out to war together. He dressed in regular clothing. He said, he say, God done said that I'm going to die in this battle because of my wickedness, that, that the king going to die. Well, I'm going to dress and not be the king, as though God can't see him in a different pair of jeans. He had red, now he got on blue, like, like he tricking God. So he go into the battle, but the enemies say, the enemies, you know, God, you know, even the wicked used by God as a tool. So the enemies of Israel in that time, Mike, God, God, God told them, the, the general said, smite the king. They went into battle, and that was their plan. We're going we to knock off the king, because if we knock off the king, the battle going to be short. But he didn't dress as a king. So he feeling like, I'm home free. I'm safe. Somebody say providence. providence. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture. That means that a, 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 just a nobody pulled his bow back. He said by venture. He just shot in the air to look like he was doing something. Everybody else fighting like, ah, better look like I'm doing something around here. He, he just shot an arrow up by venture. But watch what this arrow did. It found the king who was dressed like a regular soldier. It found the king who God had said, because of your sinful life, Ahab, you and your wife Jezebel, and all that y'all doing, you wouldn't dress like a king, but I see you. <laughs> and since I rule and reign over everything, this by chance, this random arrow that go in the sky, I'm going to make sure it's shot at the right direction, the right dimension, the right altitude, the right speed, and it's going to fall right where you at and hit you right where I needed to hit you. And smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. That means that he had full armor on. 
as a soldier, he had an armor. This, this arrow that came by chance just shot up in the air. Not only hit him, but went through a little piece of his armor in the joint, in the harness. Went through the joint of the harness and hit him where it was supposed to hit him. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. Providence. Providence. Nothing is by chance. John Calvin says, Ignorance of providence is the ultimate of all miseries. Because you're going through life thinking you just got bad luck. You see, because if it's bad luck, you can't fix that. But if you're going through life and providence is against you, you can make peace with your God. You can, you can come to God and settle the score, settle the dispute. If things not working out, it's not, it's not no goddess of fortune. It ain't no wheel of fortune. It's because you got to come and get right with God. And I feel that this is a good place to stop, even though I got so much more to tell you. Listen to me good here. You say, Pastor, how did this connect with point one? The land is ours by inheritance. He said his will that we're going to be there. Providence is God using all of his power, all of creation, to get his will done on earth and when God does a thing in his providence you look back and you say God I never thought you was able to do that you see to get us all from our land to the second Egypt in ships was a modern marvel it had never been done before but when something is in the will of God God will move heaven and earth to get you where he wants you to be. The same way he moved us by modern marvel, but I'm expecting it to be a little more comfortable this time on the way back. I don't know how, Carlos. I don't know when. But all I trust in is that word that we studied tonight, today. All I trust in is is. Providence. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know he's strong enough, I know he's wise enough, I know he's able. Anybody hear me up in here? And it won't be luck and it won't be chance that do it, y'all. It's going to be the most high. And there's going to be some that even want to do it for evil to get us out of a place. But even in their evil intentions, God going to use that through concurrence to get us where he need us to be. Come on, give y'all some glory in this house. Hallelujah. Hey. 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 Providence. Providence. He working it all out. And he working it out for our good. So there may be someone in here, you would say, man, I... I just told somebody last night I fell on my luck. <laughs> I just bought a pair of hard shoes. I was just looking outside for a four-leaf clover because they're growing in my yard right now. I just was trying to go to the fortune teller, opening the fortune cookie because I need the ball to bounce my way. I need the stars to align up my way. I tell you this morning, it ain't the stars, friend. It ain't the horse shoes. It's not even the horse. It's the one who created the horse and created the stars and gave birth to all the clovers, the flowers, the lilies, and the grass. He's the one that you got to deal with this morning. And if you're not right with him, amen, he's such a good God that you could get right. And he'll not only give you a physical inheritance, if I had time, Harvey, he'll give you a spiritual inheritance as well. 
He'll save you and give your life more abundantly. Peace that passes understanding. Joy unspeakable. And it won't be, hallelujah, luck that changed your life. Oh no, it'll be the Lord. If you're here this morning and you want to make sure that you're saved, you want to get right with God, all you got to do is admit you're a sinner, believe that he came and died on the cross of Calvary, and open your mouth and confess it. Or even if you're saved, and you've been thinking that things are accidental, happenstance, capricious. And you want to get right and give God the glory back again. You want to say, God, I've been blaming everything else, but I ain't been ascribing what's going on in my life to you. I'm living in misery because things are happening and it's not bouncing my way, but I am not understanding the story of Esther. I'm not understanding the story of Joseph. Surely weeping might endure for a night, but because of your providence, joy comes in the morning light. Oh God, I thank you for this word. If that's you, listen, you'll be able to come to this altar too because he's working it out. And he's working it out for your good. The altar is open. Come on and come. Hallelujah. And then we'll do the Lord's Supper and we're going to get out of here. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <coughs> we talked about identity, inheritance, and theology in his providence. He's working it out for your good. It's all for your good. It's all for your good. I'm going to tell the person next to you, he's working it out for your good. <coughs> Come on, tell the other one next to you, he's working it out for your good. I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> I'm telling you, you don't understand the power of providence. He, he's working it out. He's working it out. <laughs> might not feel good, might not look good, might not even sound good. But one day you're going to look back and you're going to say, God, you was in it. You was in it. You was in it. <laughs> I thank him for all my trouble. All my pain. Because under the glove was the hand of Almighty God. Mm. What you got for us, Brian? My spirit I will speak him. Got favor. They whisper, uh, conspire. Hey God. They told their lies. God favors me. Ooh. My character. My God. My integrity. Uh, my faith in God. God he favors me. Ooh. Will not fall. Come on, brother Carl. <laughs> what you say now? Won't come. What? God favors me. I speak. Speaking in prosperity, hey. and I'm speaking. God favors me. <laughs> Come on, give him a shout. Come on, <laughs> he favors you. God favors Working it out for your good. Hey, God. Hey, God. Ooh. Woo. God favors. God favors me. Come on, one more time. You say it like you mean it. God favors? God favors me. Oh, I think the spirit like that. Come on, just one more time. One more time. One more time. Come on, say that. Say, 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 say. God favors me. Oh, why, why stop here? Why stop here? Hey, God, one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. Come on. Come on. God favors speaking. God favors me. Working it out for my good. Working it out for my good. Come on, one more for yourself. Hey, God favors me. Hey, for your children. Come on, speak life. Speak life. Speak life. Come on, say it now. Come on. God favors me. Come on, even when it's going wrong. Even when it hurts. Even when I'm falling. Come on, say it. Speak it. Hey, God favors me. 
All right, here we go. Pray with me now. Pray with me now. Say, God, thank you for favor with me. Thank you for loving me. Now, Lord, I admit I'm not perfect. I've sinned. But please forgive me of all my sins. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for all my wrongs. He was buried and he rose on the third day. Now you promised if I believed that you'd forgive me and save me. Now Lord, here's my faith. Here's my belief. Now forgive me and save me just like you promised. And now God, favor me. Let things work out for my good. You promised me in the scriptures that all things would work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Well, I love you and I'm called and I'm living your purpose. Now work it out. Work it out. Work it out. When they talk about me, work it out. When they hurt me, work it out. When I lose, work it out. When I win, work it out. When I'm broke, work it out. When I'm paid, work it out. Use your providence to work it out. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, 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 hey. In my thing. My God. My God. Ushers, come on, Wild Brian.